And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome to the Ben Linux Foundation of Public Health. Um, my name is Jim St. Clair. I am the executive director, and I am very pleased to have an all-star panel for you today uh, talking on the broader concepts of open source program offices, and most importantly, the work done by um, the World Health Organization in partnership with uh, uh, GitHub and, and others to be able to really inculcate and develop open source solutions. Now, uh, every open source strategy, uh, or excuse me, every open source application, open source utilization starts around strategies of the organization to use open source. And more and more, there have been uh, greater programmatic efforts across the world and numerous corporations and other organizations uh, to create open source program offices to bring together a strategic focus on the use of, of open source. And in fact, the growth has been so great that here at the Linux Foundation, we have a complementary program uh, to uh, LFPH called the To Do Group. And I'm thrilled to be able to introduce Ana Jimenez as a director of the To Do Group to speak a bit about open source program offices, our work at Linux Foundation. And then, of course, we'll dive specifically into Dushan and Amon's presentation and discussion. Uh, on the World Health Organization. Uh, Anna, welcome, and would love to hear a few thoughts about uh, OSPOs and the to-do group. Hi, um, thank you so much, Jim. Um, well, I will drop some slides uh, when I finish so people can follow through afterwards. Uh, but for those who are unaware of to-do group, uh, we are an open community of practitioners. Uh, that are help working together to uh, create best practices, tooling, resources to help others and other organizations worldwide to create effective open source program offices. Um, so as Jim was commented, uh, why creating this? Well, uh, right now, uh, he mentioned the importance of putting a strategy on top of the open source efforts. Indeed, um, uh, right now, open source is everywhere, and uh, if we go beyond that, uh, we will. Some organizations start to realize that um, adopting an open source strategy is no longer optional. We need policies. Uh, an organization might need policies, standards, best practices, playbooks, guides on uh, and, and a strategic place and centralized place to uh, create this open source um, to. Um, operate with all these open source efforts. So that is the main mission of, of Tutu Group, of this open community. Uh, and right now we have been growing a lot. We are right now more than 1,600 1, community participants, more than 70 Tutu members, organizations with an OSPO uh, that um, our season of sports that has been running OSPO over the past decade. And also we have OSPO associates that are other communities that might not have an OSPO, but are helping the OSPO movement and are collaborating and working together with Tudu to um, work on essential needs for the OSPO, such as how can we bring open source security to OSPOs and to the OSPO teams? How can we bring effective open source compliance and manage licensing to this OSPO? So thanks to these communities that has this domain knowledge on a specific OSPO responsibilities, we're also trying to help out um, uh, in, in this mission. Um, and also just to let you know that Judo is more than just a group. It's also an education hub. We are actually have like OSPO 101 courses, free and open to everyone. Um, we also have a network of experts that are always willing to help other uh, OSPOs that are starting their OSPO journey. Um, and we also have uh, research studies, OSPO tooling, and, and networking spaces is for specific regions. We have a Tudu European chapter and Tudu APAC chapter and so on. And I just wanted to highlight regarding the research that uh, we are now conducting our fifth uh, OSPO survey to get the pulse of what is the OSPO adoption on the different regions and what's going on in the different industries. And we are closing this survey on Friday. So I think uh, Jim will drop the link to, so everyone that is involved in open source 
are in OSPOS, uh, please feel free to take the survey. We really need uh, to um, make your voice heard and also uh, get feedback from organizations across different industries and different regions uh, to get quality data. So um, saying that, um, welcome. We welcome if you're interested to join the community, say hi on the Slack channel and uh, take a look to the Ospology repo that it's like the starting point if you want to learn more about it. And thank you so much, LF Public Health. Thank you so much, Jim, for inviting me and for uh, allowing me to, to share my uh, remarks on, on to -do. Thank you so much. Absolutely, Anna, thank you very much. And I did drop the link for the To Do Group website into the chat, which gives you the links to both the GitHub resources and the um, Slack channel. Uh, and also did post the link to be able to get to our research survey that Anna referenced. And please don't hesitate to, to fill that out so we can better understand that development. Uh, with that, I'm thrilled to introduce you to um, uh, Mala Kumar, who is the Director of Social Impact for GitHub and helped uh, lead a lot of the coordination efforts with Dushan Amon, uh, and would love to hear some more from the OSPO perspective at GitHub. So with that, Mala, I'd love to turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Jim. Um, so I'm just gonna post a couple of links in the chat. So I'll be talking through some of the stuff that's come out in our blog post from March, and then some slides that are linked from that blog post uh, publicly so you can follow along. Um, so as Jim mentioned, I'm the Director of Tech for Social Good on the GitHub Social Impact team. And I've been at GitHub for about three years and some months. But prior to that, I actually worked in tech for international development, largely in public health for the United Nations for most of my career. So I built out you know, a lot of tools in my career for different UN agencies. And so when I came over to GitHub and you know, back here in New York City, saw that COVID cases were spiking in March, 2020, we decided to reach out to WHO and see if we can try to you know, support in some way. Of course, every other tech company in the world had the same idea. And so <laughs> it took a while to find the correct people at WHO. But fortunately, the epidemiologist that I was able to connect to did put me in touch with Dushan. And from there, the, you know, the partnership has just kind of exploded over the last two and a half years. Um, Dushan's going to talk a lot about, I think, the inner source component of what GitHub has been able to do and really bringing all of the different you know, developers and the code bases over to GitHub to create like one unified enterprise license. But then at the same time, a lot of what we were looking at was just conversation after conversation from different teams on open source. So a lot of the work that we do at GitHub is research and open source and social good. And from that, we know that some countries, for example, do have very strict policies around what needs to be open source if there's a new tool being built. Other countries are somewhere in between. Some countries have no policies at all. But the point is that if you're the World Health Organization and you're trying to deploy a tool to maybe 15 or 20 countries, some of those countries will require at least some of those components to be open source. And so we know that this is gonna be a challenge across the organization. And so starting to talk to teams, we heard that there were some patterns emerging and we decided to really get more structured about it. And we created some you know, baseline questions and decided to do semi-structured interviews across different teams that were using open source, that were trying to create something that's open source and even release something that's open source for the, you know, the greater community to use. And from those you know, conversations, we realized that the open source program office is actually a really good way to orient this work because the need is there and we really just need to have the capacity internally to make sure that software developers, product managers, designers, whoever's working on open source actually has the resources internally to, to go about this in a systematic way. Um, and so on some of the slides that you can see, so I think it's slide seven, for example, after talking to all of these teams at WHO, um, kind of collated the responses and then created a heat map across different functional areas that an OSPO could work in. So the technical areas when it comes to actual technology like security, um, technical areas like programmatic areas, like if you're an epidemiologist or malaria expert and we're trying to build a tool on those teams. Um, procurement is always a, a big issue with UN anything. And then of course, legal, internal culture. And one part that I'm super excited about in the long term is really this economic and cultural part. Um, one of the challenges that we have at tech companies, especially those based in the states, is that there's often not legal entities in a lot of low and middle income countries, and so it's not possible to hire directly from those countries. Um, the UN is a very unique example in the world in that basically any person of any nationality can work in any country. It's not easy to do that. And so with that in mind, that means that we can bring really talented developers from low and middle income countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, Latin America, a lot of these places that are underrepresented in open source. 
and have them come and take the lead in, in a lot of the open source work. And so creating this OSPO and potentially engaging with countries in a way that tech companies, again, can't necessarily do, really has huge potential for not only creating more solutions, but making sure that the solutions that are created in the social impact space, which often are for people in low and middle income countries, is participatory. I mean, even if the communities that are building the tools are not exactly the same as the people who are benefiting from the tools, it's a lot closer than getting somebody like me who was born and raised in North America building those tools. So really excited for the potential of what could happen with the WHO OSPO. Um, I'll let Bushan and I talk in more detail about what that's gonna look like, but it's been a great partnership so far. We are working with several other specialized agencies of the UN and the Secretariat potentially um, to create a new OSPO. So looking forward to the work that could happen there. Um, and feel free to get in touch if you have ideas on how that should shape. Thanks. Fantastic, Mala, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, Dushan, Amon, uh, we're thrilled to have uh, the opportunity for you to take it away and give us an overview of what you've been working on. Great. Thanks, Jim. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Eamon Bader. I work for the World Health Organization. I'm currently um, managing the project management office for a new division within the organization which deals with surveillance and intelligence uh, for epidemics and pandemics. And within that a function, we are hoping, well, we are launching an open source program office, which we're talking about today, which is really cool. Um, just a few points, I guess, maybe uh, before Dushan kicks us off with some of the details. I think it's important to note um, that the core, core competencies or the core areas of work of WHO and many, many of its partners, member states and so forth, is in public health and not in technology. But because of gaps that exist um, throughout uh, different parts of the world, in areas to do with different functions to do public health, in our space we deal with health emergencies, so things like contact tracing or early warning disease surveillance and so forth, some member states lack the capacity, lack the solutions, lack the functions in there. So WHO and other partners augment that by developing solutions um, to help uh, fill those gaps. And quite often what happens is that we're good at building the solutions um, to a certain scale, you know, one country, a pilot, two or three countries. Um, but where we struggle is in sustaining these solutions, in partnering for growth, for scale, and obviously things like governance and uh, and decision making within these products is also lacking. Um, you know, and it's not to say that we've just started working on open source within WHO. There's been many endeavors uh, throughout the years within WHO, all throughout the pockets of different uh, groups and, and areas and technical special specialization. But it was really the pandemic that, uh, as Marla mentioned, sort of sparked the the need. You know, the, just the overwhelming love that we got from tech sector, uh, some of it useful, some of it um, slightly distracting, but ultimately resulted in us rethinking how could we take advantage of not only uh, the private sector, but also uh, the global community to improve how we work and collaborate and, and scale and so forth. And, um, and I think the collaboration we had with GitHub who came through those channels has been amazing. Uh, and Marla has helped us since with the leadership of Dushan to start um, articulating our ambition, our vision, and, uh, and our way forward for, for an OSPO within the organization. Um, what our ambitions are is that, you know, with, you know, to pick sort of to carry on with some of the comments I made around um, the challenges we face, a lot of our colleagues uh, that have open source solutions or are hoping to embark on open sourcing their solutions, um, they just don't know. They don't know what license to use and in what context. They don't know um, what the potential of collaboration exists out there. They don't know how to scale their products. They don't know the implications for IP and legal as well as uh, procurement if they want to hire a vendor to, to build off their solution that are not wording to include in, con and, uh, in terms of conditions and so forth. Um, and so the OSPO that we want to put in place and we've started working on is a support function for that and an adversary advisory function for the organization, but as well as member states that face the same challenges. Um, I liked what was mentioned earlier by, by Anna, things like FAQs, playbooks, guidelines, as well as direct support. And we have a number of prime mover initiatives that are uh, that we've restarted engaging with um, and I'm happy to report that we'll have an OSPO lead joining us in September that will really spearhead this moving forward and there's a whole bunch of uh, deliverables and milestones that I have ready for, for this person so I'm excited about that. I think uh, without um, holding you back too much one thing I'd like to say just, just in summary I think the, the, the one thing that we're hoping to achieve here is that you know we, we acknowledge that there are many people many institutions around the world working on amazing things but are also facing the same challenges same limitations and our approach that we want to put in place is to help connect these people, empower these people, and also obviously take advantage of all the great work that's existing in these pockets, but uh, but making it more impactful by bringing it together. Um, and on that note, I'll hand over to my colleague, Dushan. Thank you. 
Thank you, Eamon, and, and thanks everyone for the introduction. My, my name is Dusan Ivanovic. I'm a um, health intelligence architect in uh, WHO, in Health Emergency Program, uh, and also in the new WHO Hub for Pandemic Epidemic Intelligence. I'm, I'm telling you this, these buzzwords because, I mean, they are maybe the, the initial, they, they were um, um, the reason and the needs there were the reason for us to, to think about engaging wider community in developing solutions for um, public health surveillance and, and intelligence. Um, so in saying that, um, and I'm trying to I click, doesn't work, sorry. Yep. So um, the, the initiative itself um, actually started, and I think Eamon, what Eamon mentioned is, is really um, um, uh, the key here. The WHO is, is um, responsible for uh, coordinating activities uh, in the domain of global health uh, security um, and coordinating um, you know, collaboration and activities between member states uh, more particular. And, and one part of WHO since 2016 or 17 is engaged in trying to also help member states on their demand in uh, different type of activities in prevention, preparedness, response and recovery to public health threats or uh, if they develop further as outbreaks uh, or pandemics, for example, COVID-19 as health emergencies. Um, so um, the team I work, work with um, basically engages in public health intelligence and more, more precisely the system that we are um, uh, developing and uh, the global community of practice, not just WHO um, people, but, but the global community of practice is engaged in trying to um, um, provide actionable intelligence for decision making out of different surveillance activities um, and risk assessment, and in particular using open source intelligence. Um, so the need that we have, I mean, what, what we're doing is open source intelligence is actually um, uh, really um, uh, monitoring um, and collection of data, information, insights, knowledge uh, that is publicly available in this particular case, mostly on the web, but also from other media, traditional media and, and other sources like social networks, for example. Um, and, and basically the idea is, is and, and, the, and, and the main objective of open source intelligence in public health is early detection of public health threats. And then, you know, uh, verification, assessment of risks uh, in order to, um, and then assessment of risks using contextual information to provide actionable intelligence for decision making uh, throughout the life cycle of health emergencies, as I said, prevention or even forecasting maybe one day if we get to that, uh, prevention, preparedness, response and recovery. Um, so this system basically and our needs there and especially needs to use technology uh, for open source intelligence actually triggered the idea of um, investing into uh, first understanding the needs within the organization and the global community, and then also trying to find the solution um, and really to start uh, you know, using open source software uh, where it fits the purpose. And where it does fit the purpose in this particular domain is, for example, open source ma machine learning models and other advanced analytics algorithms. And there's, for, for example, for natural language processing um, or conversion speech to text and then discovery of the topics that text is all about or, or even um, entities and other structured information from the text. Um, and, and we had also need to, to then uh, centralize the code base uh, that is developed by different partners globally. And as I said, that was a grassroots initiative of, of the team. And we suspected that probably there is a need uh, in different kinds of domains of activities in WHO for the open source software. So, so we asked colleagues and then we discovered, for example, another big initiative or important initiative is, is a contact tracing uh, within the scope of global outbreak and response network that is coordinated by WHO, again, led by WHO and coordinated, but it's actually also a global community of practice and, and the largest one of the kind. Um, and, and maybe you, you, you hear me talking about WHO coordinating, and it's really not WHO and it's not internal organizational needs only, it's really global needs, as, as Mala mentioned, and, and also Eamon. Um, so uh, in this particular case, for example, uh, for this contact tracing application that is used in 60 odd countries today, um, um, the, 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 the application itself is, or solution is developed using op open source software components. 
And now the next phase is to try to provide open um, APIs for interoperability with other solutions and uh, also to engage global community of, of uh, Go data users uh, for sharing analysis. So these are particular needs that this particular platform has. And then, of course, we discovered many more. Uh, and you can see it's, it's pretty diverse. I mean, um, health workforce, public health intelligence, as I mentioned, global malaria program, a team who is engaged in uh, guidelines and policies and architectures for digital uh, health innovations, child health, um, um, solution for, again, early warning and response uh, in emergency settings or humanitarian settings, EWARS. Um, so basically, you know, there, there, is, there is really a number of different examples. And we discovered that we have um, publicly available open source software, uh, but there is no organizational support. And all these different teams are going along, trying to do the best. And, and what really happened is, is basically they're trying to engage in open innovations, but it takes more than just publishing software and the company documentation in public repository, for example, in GitHub. That's not enough. Uh, there, there is more that, it, uh, that we need to set up for open innovations and especially open innovations using technology. So just before I, I, I go on with, with um, um, what we discovered as a solution, which, which you can guess it's an open source program office, maybe just some taxonomy or some terminology. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned a couple of times open innovation. Uh, open source software is really an open source paradigm, is real extension to an open innovation paradigm. Uh, and open innovation um, uh, includes not only technology, but also business organization, people, um, uh, the domains of activities. Um, and, and really, one can argue that we can distinguish between the two types of innovation, open and proprietary innovation. So open one is when you share innovative ideas externally, and when you, when you also can assimilate external innovative ideas internally. Proprietary innovation is what big tech, for example, engages in. So um, every aspect of innovative ideas is closely guarded secret. And then, um, really there is no interest or much incentives to share uh, and helping others learn from successes or mistakes it's, it's really more about the property of um, our intellectual property there uh, when it comes to the open source paradigm it's really um, um, adding the technology components to open innovations that's that's a proposal here technological proposal so um and I, I think audience probably knows, but just let's mention it quickly. So, so basically the main common, common uh, characteristics of open source software is that number one, uh, recipients of the open source software can freely use, modify and distribute the software um, and the source code, the human readable code um, is made available to enable the exercise of these rights. So that's why we put them in the public repositories. I'd like to say, because there's many people who heard about the concept actually, when they hear it's free, they believe it's free of charge and it's not commercial. And this is something that we care about in WHO because as Emil said, we're engaging with not only public sector, um, NGOs, international organizations, regional organizations, um, academia, but also private sector. And um, Actually, what we believe in and know that is that, of course, private sector, for example, needs to remain commercial and profitable. But there are certain aspects that I'll mention in a second um, of, of, of uh, creative work that uh, we consider as global good. And therefore, it has to be free, of, free for sharing and uh, it belongs to everyone. Uh, it can still be commercial. And, and for example, Red Hat, Enterprise Linux is, is a product that is probably a good example. Linux itself is an open source. Um, you can go and, and use CentOS if you want to use open source that is free of charge, uh, but you, also, you can also pay uh, licenses to a company who can provide uh, sustainable development testing and, and life cycle management of sustainable solutions. So, so we are trying to find the ways and the open source program office in WHO, one of the main objectives is to try to find the ways also of, of um, sustainable engagement with all the actors globally to provide global goods and, and to, to, to provide basically solutions that uh, to, to the needs um, and the gaps that we have in health in general and public health in more particular. Um, so, 
what are the drivers of, of using open source software components? Um, and, and what are the drivers um, and, and the risks of using open source software components? So obviously, I mean, it's, it's better to reuse than to reinvent. Um, by using open source software components, uh, time to delivery uh, uh, solutions can be accelerated theoretically. And uh, one can basically engage potential large community of contributors of these uh, um, inbound uh, open source software that can be used. And we know a lot of examples, I won't go into details. Um, however, the risks uh, and, and maybe one main risks are security vulnerabilities. I mean, the more, the more available the, the, the open source software is, the more available is also to people who would explore vulnerabilities. So security risks are higher. Um, there is a license risk. Um, in terms of that, um, you know, the, 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 the terms uh, and conditions uh, for the license uh, must be wrong for a given purpose. So one needs to pay attention to, to this in particular. Uh, there are operational risks, and by the operational risks, I actually mean that, um, you know, the, the, the support uh, depends on the contributors. So, for example, you can use an open source software component in your product, and uh, the life cycle goes on. And then uh, you know you have no control over um, um, the support and, and contributions. So you know the community can stop contributing, for example, and then you know your whole solution is endangered. So there there is an operational risk. And arguably, we can call it technical depth of, of using open source software. And there are like legal risks. Uh, I'll go into more details uh, in the next slide on legal risks there. Um, so. We have another type of open source. One is using, so inbound open source, and one is providing outbound open source. And we're actually interested in outbound as well. For example, we're providing where we different analytical methods developed uh, with partners or within WHO, and we plan to provide them as open source software. For example, algorithms and mathematical uh, and machine learning or advanced analytics models or mathematical models is one example. So the drivers of, of providing is obviously reusing improvements done by the community of contributors. So the, the key is to set up the community. Um, theoretically, we can accelerate time to delivery again because uh, community of contributors can, can be there and you don't need to, to have uh, agreements, um, collaboration agreement with each team or individual uh, on, on a given project, if the collaboration community level is, is uh, achieved. Increase so the speed of innovation again, because of, of, of the scale um, and access to more competence and knowledge for free. So again, it's, it's because of the community that, that is engaged. So the, the prerequisite is to have a community. Um, risks, again, delivery model is unsustainable. It depends on the communities and one cannot really uh, um, community can, can cease to be interested. Um, this is actually not so uh, simple. It's pretty complex to set up um, integration verification and, and you know, testing and lifecycle management. It really depends, I mean, on, on the, there's a hidden operational cost uh, to, to integrating, um, you know, software and, and versions uh, produced by different people. Um, then, you know, uh, it could be difficult to get the support for right priorities. Um, so this is also one, one of, the, of the reasons to have open source program office. I mean, the, the idea is to engage community around the right priorities. Uh, so in, in our case, for example, we need to have continuous engagement uh, with the community to, to basically uh, make it um, uh, obvious and, and widely known, uh, what are the objectives of, of WHO, what is the, the objective and, and the area of activities of public health intelligence domain in this particular case, for example, or, or public health in general. Um, and then, you know, we, what are the prioritized needs and gaps that we would like to address together with the community. And then liabilities or even branding loss. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a simple thing. And so, so legal has a big role to play because if you, if you think about this, I mean, um, you can you can basically have a, um, 
if, 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 you, if you provision a wrong license or, or for example, if you, if you license the software as a copyleft and, and share with everybody and uh, it's attributed to you as a as, as, um, contributor and then, you know, this software is then uh, modified and uh, some liabilities or, or some problems can, can uh, come out of this modified software. Liabilities depending on the license and, and the legal provisions can go all the way down to the original contributors. So one needs to be really, really careful about, about um, uh, all these risks. So if you agree on, um, if we agree on the terminology, then uh, just the last theoretical thing that I guess we, we all know who are, we all who engage in software development is, so arguably we can present it this way and, and thanks to contribution of, of a colleague from GitHub, actually this, this, is, this is an interesting uh, view on the software development lifecycle um, management and, and if you want on, on a capability maturity model of software development lifecycle. So it all starts with housekeeping. So it's really a uh, simple development of tools, if you want, uh, simple organization architecture, our development, team structure, autonomy, so everybody's developing their own tool, um, some self-servicing tooling around it to make it more efficient and maybe leverage in the cloud. So if you want to make it more efficient, um, we can use continuous integration, continuous deployment, automated testing, uh, you know, infrastructure is code, for example. So the documentation itself is a code and, and basically version control of documentation comes together with user control of the code. And in, in general, that can shorten time to production if done right. But you know, it's new, it's, it's, it's increased level of maturity and it requires investment, uh, including the organization one. And then as Mala mentioned briefly, there's something called inner source, which is actually within the organization, for example, within the WHO breakdown of silos. So basically sharing an open source within the organization itself, but not outside the organization. So that can help, you know, reusing and strategizing uh, and, and even influencing strategies. And I mentioned, you know, we actually uh, will use uh, inner source for a number of prime mover initiatives that actually are targeting, you know, changing even the paradigm, but certainly improving uh, the capabilities globally in public health intelligence. Um, then encourage cross-term projects, boost development enablement, et cetera, et cetera. That can help basically reusing different competencies, especially organizations like WHO, where we will never have a, that strong IT teams. We're not IT company and IT organization. And then this is not open source yet. Uh, if we really want to have open source and um, you know, have all these benefits that I mentioned before, um, and really have open innovations, we need to build communities, not, not only engage them and inform them, but really build them very actively, um, um, you know, communicating the needs, uh, uh, building the competencies uh, and, and building the interest in incentives around uh, working together on, in the, our particular case, achieving the global good. So there we would like to leverage WHO mandate as Sam mentioned, uh, and you know, we need to have a clear contribution guidelines. We need to publish uh, project roadmaps uh, of all the projects that are um, uh, supposed to be open source or use open source components or provide and spread the word. Um, and last but not least, then we need to manage these communities uh, to make sure that you know, they, they sustain and, and, we, and we have really sustainable collaborative development of, of capabilities and global goods. So, so we need to find a way um, how to find incentives. Um, really rewards should be taken as, you know, um, not, not uh, materialistic or tangible reward, but different kinds of rewards, incentives and recognitions um, involving people. So they become owners really, not just contributors that uh, of something that is owned by uh, WHO that is by all the member states and global community um, and and you know continuous communication with core contributors so basically nurturing this core community that is most active so th this this is the organic roadmap and we have this in mind basically um, uh, and uh, when when we we basically um, defined open source open program office as a solution to our needs and Maybe just for your information, housekeeping, efficient software development life cycle, and inner source in WHO will be responsibility of chief technology office of um, information management technologies department. Uh, so it stays there. Inner source is a new thing for them, um, already accepted. 
And then community building and community management will be um, additional extra that open source program office will add to other um, domains that also Mala mentioned is important to take care of and I also mentioned important to think about and, and find the solutions for and, and get support. So um, this, is, this is what we agreed on the organizational level and last but not least, then we said, okay, fine, for, for the needs that we, we uh, identified, and that is um, to, to basically understand better uh, legal side and license side of using and providing open source uh, software, um, um, helping with setting up uh, policy and guidance for uh, procurement for using open source packages, so for inbound open source software, um, for uh, technical, so I mean there is a programmatic one. Uh, so how do you how do you organize projects and programs uh, around using and providing open source software? Um, uh, what are the economic inclusion benefits of open source software? How do we make a decision to go open source or not from the programmatic point of view? And then technology, um, a lot of things that are. Um, uh, a little bit different than when you do everything in-house and silo, for example, building and maintaining tools for DevOps so that the whole process can work, um, develop trainings for, for um, uh, non-developer community, uh, for example, community which will do testing or system validation, UET, and of course, security policies and, and uh, you know, uh, security um, at the time of design rather than when everything is finished. Um, and I mentioned capacity, so I, I won't repeat it here, but you know, it's really about developing trainings, uh, educating developers, supporting employees to develop their capacity, and also guidelines and policies and processes, making them publicly available uh, and, and in that way uh, engaging with, with the community. And last but not least, uh, the fifth pillar in, in this multidisciplinary open source program office approach would be communication, um, advocacy, external engagement, internal engagements, et cetera. So, so this is how we see a multidisciplinary approach to providing advice to, to any um, a project that has a need or would like to explore uh, whether to use and or provide open source software. So, so that's, that's the key really to provide it's a benevolent leader, uh, guidelines and guidance and policies um, uh, should be uh, provided or, or led by open source program office. But actually, it's really about providing advice to individual projects uh, and, and people in individual projects actually will, they know the best, you know, what the needs are. They, they only don't most probably have uh, competencies needed uh, to, to understand, you know, whether the open source is fit for purpose and therefore this competence should be provided in the open source program office. Um, so, I, I will not go into details, but just a quick overview. Um, there are many reasons why licenses are key. And, and it's not, uh, we, we heard them in discussions and, and uh, in, in um, um, different uh, uh, analysis of, of, of uh, what we do best way to, to, to go and whether we should have as WHO or Open Source Program Office uh, specific recommendations or even rules which licenses to use when uh, it was really difficult. I mean, the software can be anything. It can be, as I said, mathematical model itself, um, an algorithm that uh, with, with software packages and dependencies is used to, to productify that mathematical model in a certain tool. Um, it can be user front end, it can be some business rules, it can be, you know, a, a database management system that you, we use uh, to implement, you know, uh, data management layer, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, um, one software, one solution can contain uh, different software components that could in principle have different licenses. What is really important is to understand what the solution needs are and what is the purpose of the solution in order to basically decide whether um, ultra permissive or permissive uh, open source software licenses are okay to use or should be used or must be used. Permissive in terms of uh, that uh, one can uh, modify them and put in the intellectual property on modification or you know, weak or strong copyleft or, or more, more uh, if you want, um, uh, 
restrictive licenses, which actually does not allow um, uh, proprietarization of, of the versions or modifications of the software. Um, and, and for example, you know, our mathematical models, we consider them as a global good. Uh, we would like the whole world to use them and modify and improve and share back. And therefore, for example, they are, they are um, uh, prime, prime candidates, or even, you know, these are all mandatory requirements for a copyleft type of license. Um, and I will finish with um, going back to, to what Mala mentioned and also Eamon. So why GitHub? Um, before GitHub became, which was just last year, I think, uh, officially uh, code base and centralized code base and, 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 and Git distributed version control system that um, is um, recommended by WHO globally, um, we, we were using SVN mostly. And as you know, I mean, SVN does not have a and the platforms built on that do not have any, any ways to, to share uh, openly uh, source code and, and, and documentation. So basically we did not have a solution. You know, we, we needed open source, but we did not have support in WHO. We didn't have a tool to make it really organizational uh, and, and to support it organizationally. So um, well, GitHub uh, was one of the obvious candidates because of, of the, the user base, which is probably, not probably, it's definitely the biggest. Um, and, and we had support for open source software. There are public internal repositories um, uh, also in, in GitHub Enterprise Cloud that we have in and using ent um, uh, Enterprise account uh, and Enterprise licenses. And, and as I said, it's a centralized place. It does inspire collaboration and reuse. And it has hybrid support for both public and private repositories. So public and private are the same as you have seen in, in, in a public GitHub uh, cloud web application. But you also, the thing that you don't see unless you're using enterprise cloud or if you, unless you have enterprise account is, is so-called internal repositories, which are actually there to implement this sharing within the organization, within the members of the GitHub organization, but not outside. So it's kind of open source within the boundaries of the organization, which is quite interesting feature for WHO. And just for your orientation, a uh, number of repositories or, or projects currently in, uh, as of today is 292. Uh, and you can see distribution, we still have 147 private. Uh, we have 69 internal, which is interesting, and similar number of public, uh, 76. So if you, if you go to GitHub uh, organization, you can see um, 76 public repositories and you're free to, to look, look what's there. We're not, housekeeping is not perfect, um, uh, far from it. So I'm not sure how, how well documented uh, the guidelines, policies, and licenses are. In some cases, they are well documented, in some not. Um, but that's why we are establishing open source program office to make this clean. Number of collaborators uh, of WHO GitHub Enterprise Cloud is, uh, we have uh, 403, um, 129 organizational members. So they are staff, WHO staff, and 274 outside collaborators. And uh, with that, I would, I would leave the floor for questions, clarifications, or anything else. Excellent, Dushan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eamon, for your comments as well. Uh, please take the time now to go into the Q&A and enter any of your questions for our panelists and discussions. Um, Dushan, I'll just kind of kick it off because um, I, obviously we had the pleasure to, to meet in person and go through this and discuss. Uh, one of the things I'd like to, to present back, um, and I think we touched upon this in our conversations, was uh, how public agencies now kind of have an opportunity to move away what, from what I call commercial procurement decisions for their technology evolution and start considering it in terms of open source. And I think that starts with a cultural shift first. Are you starting to encounter that kind of cultural shift? I think you kind of laid out some of those points in the maturity model, but was just kind of curious about your feedback of what you've encountered and, and thought processes for education and the like. Yeah, and then actually you, you're right. And it's, 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 it's a paradigm shift, it's a cultural shift, definitely. And, and maybe, you know, I, 
we we did uh, Mala actually helped us with with the cross WHO uh, consultations uh, out of which then we we built this you know pillars and Selki open source program office actually should execute these activities to help existing projects so maybe you know it, I, I'm guessing that the, the if, if you take everybody in WHO probably most of the people really um, uh, would need to to understand better and get their head around open innovations. But actually what was the lessons learned, and I think Eamon mentioned this, um, you know, proc procurement was the first, I mean, procurement and legal embraced this. Is that, because actually they, they got a um, request for support. Uh, open source software has been used since, since long years and, and Eamon has much better insight there, there with, than, than me. Um, and maybe my team, is one of the first to start also having a need to provide open source software. So software that we're producing, we want to share with others. But, but so, we, so there is a need and there's a lot of the community was not small. Uh, that community just did not have any support. And, and basically on, on this organizational level, uh, we did not have you know, some, some consolidated view and, and organizational plan and, and guidance and policy and, and processes to support the projects. So they were pretty autonomous trying to to do their best, um, but I'm, yeah, I'm not sure how big the culture shift would be. I think the community is big enough so that it doesn't feel like a big, big change. It just feels like um, supporting quite a large community, which is diverse as well, that can actually move everybody else with them and maybe demystify some concepts that they also tried in a presentation to demystify. Mm -hmm. uh, Rachel asked a great follow-up question, I think, to that in the chat, which is realizing you're still kind of early into the journey and mapping out a lot of these components you were just touching on. Is there anything at this point that kind of calls out as a lessons learned? Like if you and Mala were doing this all over again tomorrow, are there certain things that you would push for harder or things that uh, need more momentum or that you would have done differently? That's a good question. I need to think about this. Um, I, I, will, I will definitely, I will definitely, uh, if, if you allow me to start to not directly answer a question at the beginning, I would definitely do the same as we did at the beginning. So we started with the need. We need people to share data, insights, information, knowledge, and insights, knowledge, information can also be these models and algorithms and this creative work that is software itself. And, and because we started with the need, it was very easy to find people in WHO who will support it. We did not start with going to the communication office and the legal office and have some abstract request. Can we have open source program office? Because it's, you know, it's very modern. We heard it's very good. No, no, we started with the real need. So, so this is something that, that I would not change. Um, it's easy to say, you know, as Mala said, and Ayman as well, I mean, we had, we had pandemics and it's known, it's, it's known that WHO is small actually for the needs. So people were engaged all over the place. And as well, you know, this topic was not my core topic, it still it isn't. So, so basically, you know, the support in terms of having a team to, to accelerate this. I mean, Mala, Mala said, was very positive suggesting that this is really, um, uh, it was very, we, we moved it quickly. It didn't feel quick to me, frankly. So, um, so really having having a critical critical mass of people and also team establishing the team of of individuals who are maybe engaged in legal procurement, programmatic, technical communication capacity building would be. So, so we didn't have communication capacity building, but we have them now, uh, and we could not have them really because everybody was busy with pandemic responding, uh, trying to find solution, helping global community, trying to. Um, at least um, uh, ease down this this global global big problem uh, that that we call COVID nineteen. So yeah, engagement of more people as a core team uh, uh, to to basically establish and and move open source program office and be champions from from different point of view. As I said, legal procurement, technical security there as well, communication capacity building is something that could help accelerating this. But still, we're here where we are. Yeah, I'll just add, um, I think, yeah, I think honestly, and this is going to sound a little arrogant, we actually got the majority of everything we did correct on the first try, which is, which is saying something because the UN is, is a bureaucratic set of institutions, but I think just for the fact that 
we approached it with more of an organizational management head in mind. A lot of the design work that I've done in the past, so documenting things, demonstrating need, showing patterns very early on. There's just, there's nothing to argue when you build up that evidence base. Like if you show people are already working in this way or they already need this capacity or they already need the support, then the person who ultimately shuts it down will basically be going and saying that we're just ignoring the needs of the teams. And so I think approaching it from that way was just, it was really easy, especially with having Dushan and Amon as champions internally and doing all of the bureaucratic work in the WH, WHO side to get that done. Um, yeah, honestly, we, I think we did a lot of the things in the correct way. And honestly, having somebody like me with the UN experience on the GitHub side has also been really invaluable just because you have a big private sector company coming in and just demonstrating from kind of a more neutral standpoint that this is a, a structure you see across sectors and industries. So it's not, it's not a controversial thing to start an OSPO in an organization. It's really, again, just about the need. Yeah, and Amon, you had uh, some of contribute as well. There we go. The mute button, that's right. Yeah, thanks. I've just been reflecting actually on both questions. Um, of Jim, I won't, I won't repeat um, anything. I just, just to Marla's uh, response and do chance to the last question by Rachel. Thanks for asking, Rachel. I think, you know, if because I reflect on this stuff often about what could we have done differently. And I think just, I, I echo their points. Um, the one challenge for us, though, is that we have many competing priorities within the organization. And we, we also embarked on this endeavor during uh, the height of the pandemic, like the crazy people that we are, right? And so I think, you know, this is a behavioral change initiative. We're changing hearts and minds, we're connecting people, we're instituting a different way of thinking. Um, all the, the, the recipes for success exist within the organization. There are no major resistors or blockers, but still is change that nonetheless needs to take place. So if I had to answer the question more honestly from my side, I would say that um, uh, maybe having clarity to discern how to prioritize this over other things and that's always a hindsight type response, right? Um, would have been the thing that I would have loved to have done differently. Uh, I have no regrets, no, no, no disappointments, but because it's such an exciting, important initiative for WHO and for its member states, I would have loved to have given this more energy than maybe some of the energy, the other energy that we went towards other things during the pandemic. But that's the decision you live with um, throughout the pandemic. And then the first question, Jim, I think one, one thing you mentioned this thing about big institutions like ours and, and the private sector contracts and so forth. I think it's it's important to note that there are bodies of work within the organization that are very traditional, like traditional IT departments that are have the mandate to you know, make sure that public funding, taxpayer dollars are spent correctly and efficiently, but still have to serve a whole organization. So when it comes to more established traditional type solutions like HR platforms and ERPs uh, and other workflow type programs and all this internal stuff, it's unlikely that we're going to move from your contract-based approach in the, in the short term. And that's not where our focus is gonna be. But when it comes to connecting with member states, public health facing goods, um, solutions that are, you know, that relate to changing and improving and augmenting public health emergency response or, or otherwise, that's where our focus is gonna be. And I think there's a lot of people internally that are keen for us to work in this space and, and keen to connect there. And Amon, that actually leads into something else I was wondering about, because you mentioned uh, uh, the other procurements in other parts of WHO and, and PATH and Digital Square and DPGA and the like, um, realizing that a lot of this work has been focused around open source intelligence, which selfishly I'd love to dive into as well, but uh, in broader applications of open source for WHO and in the pandemic intelligence uh, hub and then expanding from there to other parts of WHO, do you see more collaboration coming with UNICEF and UNDP and PATH and Digital Square in those areas around, you know, the open source ecosystem and digital public goods? Just a quick comment on that, I'm sure you've got more to add. But in short, yes, welcome it, uh, need it, can't see success any other way. Um, and we want to collaborate and work with these organizations because, again, uh, the reason why we're embarking on this is we recognize the limitations and the constraints uh, that we have within each of our organizations. So yes, a double yes. Dushan? Yeah, maybe maybe just uh, some context. So yeah, G Jim and I discussed about different types of intelligences for different purposes. Here we're embarking public, for public health reasons, but actual terminology is the same as in intelligence, communities, state, military, whatnot. We, we borrowed it from there. Um, the, 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 as Emma said, it's, it's a big yes. Actually, the need, we started with that need. Um, as you have probably noticed on the, on the COVID-19 example, 
um, we know that information exists somewhere there. It's usually available on the World Wide Web. Um, it doesn't need to be open source intelligence only or, or public information available in publicly available sources from publicly available sources, but also contextual information. I mean, you cannot provide actionable intelligence if you don't have enough information about the context. And in public health, context is everything. First, we don't look at only human diseases. Uh, I'll give an example. More than 70% of, of infectious diseases are thought to be uh, animal origin today, so-called zoonotic. So we need to look at an animal health um, and then environment health as well. And then you look at all hazards. So the conflicts, wars that we have um, unfolding all the time, including as we speak, um, human um, uh, gatherings, uh, natural disasters, climate, um, you know, you, you name it, uh, biological radionuclear, you know, incidents, um, you, you, I mean, anything can trigger uh, in a cause and effect relationship, an occurrence that might unfold as a threat or, or an outbreak. Um, and we, we still don't know the original SARS-CoV-2. Um, there are indications, people disagree, we don't have context. And then we also don't have um, uh, good ways to connect all this information that we know exists in surveillance systems, field surveillance and other surveillance systems on different levels of surveillance for the public health. So, so the idea, you know, what, what we are actually engaging with in our team is, is um, you know, this, this prime mover initiative is, is about to propose technologies and solutions to link all this different information, including contextual information. And we really need to share this back. And we need to share this analytics. And for example, we need to explain and share uh, all the information about how we optimize mathematical models in a given data sets. Uh, not to reuse so-called machine learning AI solutions from a cloud vendor, you press a button and it somehow miraculously work. It doesn't work that way. So there is a lot of needs out there that basically requires uh, collaboration, connections, and also understanding better how we share and innovate together. And that's where we come from. Excellent. That actually happens to tie into another question from Adrian, which is uh, that there is, I think, a more of a move afoot, especially within um, public health and health applications for open, transparent AI, ML models, open transparency and algorithms, and what open source can contribute to that, such as we have with the, the LFAI and data program or project, excuse me. And, uh, um, and and sounds like that's a, an area for us to consider as well. So. Lastly, we have time for one last question. Julieta asked, I think, a great question on the maturity model, which is, do you envision incorporating or inculcating more performance metrics to be able to show uh, whether they be economic, financial, or operational improvements that you're noticing in your efforts by leveraging the OSPO concept in open source? Yeah, yeah, and that's connected also to when it comes to open source software, it's technological component to open innovations. We already have a tools to measure the performance itself. We have a tools to, to basically make it more performant and more mature, like software. That's why you know this maturity model, software development life cycle of maturity model, and emphasis on that. Um, so that's all part of it. Um, and uh, um, actually, really. Capability maturity model, maybe somebody heard about this, is inspired by CMMI, really, a capability maturity model initiative that is used by the biggest engineering technology companies in the world, because it just provides easy way to, to assess maturity itself. So, you know, you, you want to reach managed level, you know, you, you want to have templates at the beginning, as I mentioned, guidelines and policies, and then you want to reach a managed level where people will not reinvent the wheel, but rather reuse and improve the policies, processes, uh, use documentation, and basically increase efficiency that way. So, so it's all connected, it's an ecosystem. It's really supporting thing. It's, I think in these companies, it belongs to quality management, if I remember well. Um, yeah, QMS system, ago. exactly. And I forgot the ISO standard reference to that, but yeah, it's in there. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, this has been tremendous. I want to thank Mala, Dushan, Iman, and my colleague, Anna, for your contributions. I think a uh, tremendous opportunity both for LF Public Health as well as for the to, to Do Group and Linux Foundation overall to continue our discussions and wish you certainly all the best of luck uh, and uh, 
uh, look forward to having you on for here before, as well as other conversations and collaborations in the future. Thank you again, and thank you very much.